trading is about knowing the field. Foreseeing the opportunity. Executing at the right moment. Timing is everything. It's a special for us this week. We are down at Penny Hill. And for those of you listening, it's dank, it's gray, it's drizzling. But we are down here today filming with Umbro. And as part of that, the England head coach, Eddie Jones, has said he'll have a sit down with us for 45 minutes or so. Tins is alongside. Hello. Back in your old stomping ground. Does this Hello. bring back so, happy memories or uh, torture chamber memories? No, uh, well, it brings back happy and sad memories. Obviously, the great times that have been had here. But then also there were low periods too. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it's changed a bit. There was not that ginormous building there. There was uh, like basically two tents at the time uh, <laughs> that we used to train in. It's slightly different now. Um, it's a bit more the elite performance that it possibly should be. It looks very, very impressive. It's, it's big. There's a half an indoor training centre. There's a gym. There's all sorts of bits and bobs, which we'll uh, hopefully discuss with Eddie in a moment or two. But when you talk about that, that I mean, let's talk about 03 here. I mean, I remember watching some of the footage of that before you actually ended up going to the World Cup, and it looked like you as players went to places that I'm, I'm sure you never even dreamt you could reach. Didn't you, um, yeah, it, it, it was unbelievably hard, but it was so well managed and well structured, you know, <laughs> forced sleeps where you had to go for an afternoon nap. Um, Is that but, right? Yeah, yeah. So you'd get up at six, you'd, be, you'd start your first ses session at 6.15, You'd uh, go through till breakfast, then you came back out for another session. Then between like 12 and two, uh, 12, 12 and four, you had to try and go to sleep. Then you'd have your next session at four, finishing off with something at six, and then eat your t dinner and then rinse and repeat. So it was, it was intense, but it was done in a very scientific way. Dave Reddy did a fantastic job of that. I mean, if rugby sessions ran over, he would run on the pitch and go, no, nope, get off. Really? Cut every coach down. and. Yeah, and that was good, one of the good things with Clive. He gave him the power to do that. Worth mentioning, Hask is on his way back from Dubai this week, so he will be very, very sad to be missing out uh, on a chit-chat with Eddie, given how much we know the um, love and respect did, that he has he for his former England that. head coach. Uh, we're going to go inside, though, now. And I suppose just before we do that, what do we want to get out of this? What do we want to hear from Eddie? Uh, I think a little 2021 review would be quite nice, yeah. where he sees the Six Nations uh, next year. Obviously, all the teams are looking very sharp where Northern Hemisphere rugby is. Um, what he's got planned for Christmas? Are we invited? Is there a <laughs> turkey Christmas on the go? Bash? Yeah, One eggnog. Of wrapped his Christmas presents. Fingers crossed. As we say, it's drizzling. We're going to go inside into the elite England high performance centre and have a chat with the England head coach Eddie Jones. So come with us, Eddie. Happy Christmas! Thank, Thank you me. very much indeed for coming to join us uh, or for having us in your office, Miss Blendon. Have you got the tree up? Uh, no, not really, mate. We're not big Christmas people. Really? Have you done any shopping? I was going to say that because the, what is Japan like it because I've heard stories that it's still just a work day. It's yeah, not... no, it's just work day. Um, right. So the big thing is there's all cakes out on Christmas Eve. People buy cakes on Christmas Eve and by Christmas Day all the decorations are gone. Right. It's just normal work Short and day. sweet. Yeah. <laughs> so you've, have you done any present buying at all? Uh, no, zero. No, right, okay. So we're going to start. <laughs> we've, we've got a little something for you. Oh, thank you. Just to say happy Christmas. It's, not, it's has, something for your desk. Has, well, it's not his book. No, he's give, apparently he's given you a copy of that already. Have you read his book or not? Uh, a couple of pages. Right, well, uh, that's probably enough. Feel free to open <laughs> it. This you. is from James. You're allowed to open okay. it. It's, from, it's actually from James. It's something for your office. Um, and he hopes you like it very much. He's sadly not here at the moment. He's on his way it's back not, from it's Dubai. It's not his, his top three hit. Well, it's his only three hits. It's not his top three book. But well, you, he, 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 yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. So you can it like, opens it, up, does it? It opens up and it yeah, it stands yeah, on your desk, on, on your, your sideboard. So That's not bad. It's not bad. He looks quite good there. <laughs> yeah, he's about 10 years old. That's the best I've seen him look for. About 10 years, actually. Yeah. He's smartly dressed there, Smartly dressed. He's a man for all seasons. He says, happy Christmas, and he's very sad he can't thank be you. here. But we're delighted to be able to catch up with you. Yeah. Um, how are you? Very well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Has it been a, a relaxing couple of weeks post-November? Uh, well, it's never, coaching's never really relaxing. Yeah. But uh, like it was good to have three wins. Last last one was a lucky one. You know, you either, you win by a point, you're lucky. You lose by a point, you're unlucky. You're better off being the lucky two. Oh, uh, yeah. So have you, have you sort of 
put November to bed, or are you still sort of... Let me get rid of that for you, because otherwise you're going to be holding that forever. I'll give it to you on the way out if you'd like it. We'll, we can use it as a doorstop. There is a bin just on There's the way out. There's a bin on the way out. <laughs> Thank you, James, for that. Have, have you put November to bed, or is, it, is there still quite a lot to be going no, through? No, 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 we've, we've moved on. Uh, so Six Nations, starting to look at the games and see what uh, talent we can unearth. You never strike me as someone who looks back too much. It's always about moving forward. You always talk about... Know, players that you're going to be playing with and how you then suit those players to how you want to play. Um, so is it always just a very, very short review? You know, because you look, you know, I mean, what can you take out of that South Africa game? Maybe you would say you're lucky, but I'd say you earned your luck in the first half with how you played. Um, but does it always, right, next job? Next yeah, it's game? mostly feed forward, mate. I think one of the things I've learned is that a lot of things that have happened don't necessarily replicate themselves going forward. So we definitely need to improve our set piece from the South Africa game. But apart from that, the next and the Six Nations is a completely different competition than the Oral. So we've got to we we'll start preparing for the Six Nations. Is that where you go back? It's going to be more attritional. Yeah, hundred percent. Can you not try and change that? To change? I well, know the weather will dictate some of it, but yeah, we you know we want to continue down the line where we want to be good at at being old England, which is set piece, defence. Then we've got this idea of New England where we want to be able to break quicker, attack faster, be more aggressive. Like that. We, we were talking just before we started rolling at you as, as to how much the game has changed. 12 months, 15 months, 18 months, I don't know, you put the time on it. But do you, are, are you coaching a different game now to that that you were last year? We coach the game. Um, you try to work out what the game is and, and where it's going to go. And it's like Mike was saying before, yeah, the speed of the rucks generally increased quite amazingly. Like the average speed of, of most of the competition has gone from four seconds to three seconds, which means now that the defence time, the defence time has been minimised, which allows attack more, more opportunities to get on the front foot, which again means the defence is on the back foot. And as Mike was saying, if you've got a running nine and a 10 that plays flat, now you can really attack aggressively. How much change and, and how pleased have you been, I suppose, with the element of change that you've gone through in 2021? Uh, really good, mate. Um, but you're never satisfied. But, yeah, we were always going to go through a period post the World Cup where we had to change the team. Yeah, I think teams generally have about a three-year life cycle. And so we were end end of that cycle, which coincided with the Lions tour. Um and we're lucky we've found some really good young players to come through. You know, that's the other bit. You know, sometimes your team gets old, but sometimes young players aren't ready. Yeah. Um, and it's finding that right spot where the older players maybe had enough and the younger players are ready to go. Do you think, interestingly, you talk about young players now and then you look around Australia, you look at France, um, you know, you look at what, what we've got going on, uh, even somewhere like Scotland, you've got these all these this hotbed of youth and young young players coming through. Is it great to see, I know that, not to go back to Clive, but Clive always said, if you're good enough, you're old enough, no matter. Is that something that you'd sort of buy into is what we're seeing is these guys are a different level skill wise and they bring a confidence. They don't bring, we've always talked about history. So like when I, when I turned pro, all the old players had a history of hurt from losing to players or scenarios. Whereas the, these young you know, look at someone like Marcus Smith who plays what he sees in front of him or you'd say Finn Russell who doesn't might make a howling mistake but he never he doesn't live by it He's, he clears it out of his head is it nice to see that enthusiasm uh, contrasted with the skill that they bring with it as well to, to take to international yeah rugby? 100% mate and and sometimes you're lucky you get a group of players coming through that are all the same age and they and they and they they get strength from each other you know they all come through 21, 22. They're playing a different way. They're playing together. That they've got they've got a smile on their face because they're playing like that. And if you've got that with a group of experienced players who can do all the hard work, then you've got a good mix. And we're we're not there, but we're I think we're going in the right direction. It's quite a soft question, but it looked a very happy camp in November. Did you get a sense that, that, that there's a lot of fun around what you're trying to do at the moment? Uh, it always comes from the players, mate. Um, yeah, I've always found that if you've got the right group of players, you get that environment. Like the coach can affect it. There's no doubt about it. But if you get the right group of players and they enjoy being with each other and 
enjoying being with each other is enjoying the way they play. And sometimes you'll get the blokes who like to have a beer together and like to enjoy each other's company off the field. But it's the enjoyment they get on the field together. And is that a fact? Because we were talking cricket earlier as well, about that, particularly about that Australia team, um, 90s and 2000s, who didn't necessarily get on but were very good at what they did. Is therefore just that element of fun and enjoying each other's company, is that an added bonus or in the world that we live in today, is that fundamental to, to then driving success? Well, I think there's been a fundamental change in the way teams operate. Like I think now that element of enjoyment is much more crucial than it was before. Not saying that it wasn't important before, but the fun tended to be different. Now I think the players need to feel a bit freer than they did before. And maybe I'm not making a lot of sense now. But you look, you look at most sporting events now, like players before the event are generally much more uplifted than they were before. You know, before yeah. you go in a stadium, you'd be down like this and, you know, you, your eyes would be down and you'd, and you'd be acting humble. Now they want to, you know, look up, have a smile on their face. You know, Marcus Smith's a good example, isn't he? Yeah. Like when he's smiling, he, he feels like he's right to play. Yeah. And that's how he's grown up. I, I feel it's been a, a big shift through through COVID and then the Six Nations, how tight that was. I think it was obviously quite hard for all the players that were involved and obviously everyone had different regulations and everything. So it was probably a little bit freer. But I think environments now are about you have to take in and enjoy that environment that you're in. And, and you know, going back to the conversation, we are, you always ask me about the World Cup final week, you know, Yes, it's the biggest week of your life, but it's the week you've got to enjoy the most because everything you've yeah. done in the past is supposed to be there. And that should be how it should be for every international game. You should be going there going, I've earned to be here. Yeah. This is going to be the best time of my life whilst I play it. And then you'll hopefully play your best game at the same time. Yeah. They always say a smiling boxer is a dangerous boxer. And I don't know whether, I mean, do you see that in the way that your, your, your team well, are? I think, I think it's the belief setting. in the confidence to be yourself. Like yeah. at the end of the day, like, Test rugby is the greatest examination of yourself, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah. Because at club level, you tend to play together, but test level, you've got a different role to do and you've got to go out there and be yourself and fit in with the other players. Yeah. So it's that being yourself, but also fitting in with the team around you. What did you learn in November? Uh, that we're lucky at the moment. You know, we've got some good young players coming through and they're all about the same age. They're good kids too. Um, and we've got some of the guys who went on the Lions tour who have been through a tough period, are ready to go again. Who, who in particular? Who, who? Oh, I think Owen, Maro, uh, Jamie George, really pleased the way he came back. Um, and then we've got the middle group of players like the Slades and Genge who are now seeing opportunity to be senior players yeah. that are going to carry the team forward. What pleased you most about November? Uh, I was winning by a point against South Africa. <laughs> but, that's, uh, but that's a really interesting question. I mean, did, did, because I was going to ask you whether that, that result, you played so well for large parts of that game. Was the, did, did the result materially define November for you, or would you have taken a lot from it regardless of that goal? The big, the big thing about that game, we had to win it three times. And generally, big games, you have to do that. And, but that's the hard part because. Yeah, particularly when you're a young team and you feel like you've done enough to win it and then yeah. that gets taken away and you've got to go again. That's a hard test on the field. And so we did that, we did that at least three times. One and yeah. a half, had it one and a half time. They wore us down. We got back in front. They got another try and then we had to win it again. And just to keep that being in the moment and keep keep playing the way you want to play is, is, is the most pleasing thing. So even, even though the f first half I thought we were pretty dominant, you take more out of that second half about finding yeah. out what, what's yeah. in people's souls, don't you? Yeah. Uh, in terms of you know, when you have to dig around in yeah. there and you know, it must put you in a really yeah. nice, nice, warm, fuzzy place that yeah. when it, I was going to say shit at the time, but we can't really <laughs> say that. But when, when the time got a little yeah. bit tough, they, yeah. all, they all stood up, the people that you needed yeah. to. And you look at that second half, you know, I think we lost the last four lineouts, lost the last three scrums. You know, we had Nick Dolly's who's been playing for Castle Hill RSL in Sydney. Uh, yeah, he's playing his first test incredible way. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did you dig yourself out of that one? Uh, I think the players just kept believing. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that brilliant first phase try, which is a recognition of the players' courage to try different things um, and great coaching by Martin Gleeson. Yeah. But the courage to try that where they just ran 
like Slade, he ran a little out yeah. line against a rush defence. Marchin was courageous enough to run the inside line and then Quirk backing up on the inside. And is that training, training, training ground stuff or is that just yeah. seeing what's on? It's, it's, that's pre-planned. They, they, they saw at half time there was an opportunity to do that the way South Africa defended and, and they had, but you've got to have the courage to do it. Yeah. That's the thing with South Africa playing such a hard press, you have to have the courage to do yeah. things at the line. Yeah. It yeah. could, and yeah. sometimes it could go either yeah. way. But uh, I mean, it's just great to see that it, there is still creation of first yeah. phase in there, yeah. and it's not just a setup phase. Uh, how good is Freddie, How good is it to have someone like Freddie Stewart at the back, six foot five, hundred and four kilos, kick it all day, lads? I'm terrible right. November yeah. tash. Terrible, if you're yeah. marking him <laughs> down, terrible facial hair. Otherwise, <laughs> terrible facial hair. Yeah. No, uh, he's uh, he's like a goalkeeper, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Like. He just takes everything in the air and he's courageous. And his attacking game is going to improve. You know, that try he scored against Australia, again, where he ran a good little inside line. You know, it's good to see him developing that. And again, he's in a good team at Leicester where he's being coached well. Fearlessness of youth. Were you Australia coach in 2000 with the Dan Luger try at Twickenham? Was that just before you no, were No, that time? was before. That was just before. Good. Okay, I'm very <laughs> good. Because we were actually talking about that result, last minute try, drama, etc., and how that kick started. I know you obviously you talked about the South Africa tour as well, but that was almost a sort of flick of a coin, win it, and suddenly England were on their way. I just wonder when you're talking about that result, it, it might be too much to sort of labour the point. But how significant was the result of beating the world champions? Uh, yeah, pretty significant for a young team. You know, those sort of games you remember the rest of your life, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You know, where you dig deep, you haven't been there before. Uh, it's a good memory for the for those young blokes and for, and even for the older players, you know, because when you're an older player too, you've got to trust those younger guys. Yeah. And so you build that, that, you know, you build trust. And so if we can keep building that trust, keep building belief, keep building the sort of rugby we want to play, who knows where we can go. It's also, like, you, you know, you look at a few of those, uh, there's always that stat about a few of the Irish boys who'd, who'd only played New Zealand four times and then beat them three yeah. of them. You know, if you go into that, it completely changes mindsets yeah. as well and helps from a coach's point of view. If people don't have the fear, because, you know, normally with an All Blacks, and this is what we went back to with the history, is there'll be a historical fear because people have never beaten them. Yeah. And then, you know, from my point of view, I never lost to New Zealand going into that 2003. So if you can start getting that, and I do think now that the, the international game is quite similar throughout and it's yeah. about who can turn up on the day and and dominate that gain line and, and, and rook speed, there is always a chance that you, you'll win. And I think then it comes down to confidence and beliefs in your structures and, and how you want to play and the players that you've got. And you can take anyone off. Yeah. Do, do you see that at the moment, that, that the top eight are closer than they've ever been across the world game? And why is that? Well, I think the game's got more homogeneous. I think, yeah, there's been a lot of, a lot of pattern play in rugby that's developed because of the because of the slow ruck ball and the, and the creation of, of generally fast-moving defence lines. So everyone's become very similar in the way they play. Um, and I think the strength and conditioning around the world now is very even. Like there's, there's not gaps that used to be. Like most teams are really well conditioned. Uh, they're pretty solid at their base game. And so you need, to, you need something a little bit different to be able to break that. That's a good point. That do you think with the well, young? Well done. Good point. <laughs> no, no. But I was saying with the younger players, and you're saying the structure of slow ball game, because they've played it all the way through their their young lives, and then at twenties is all built around generally speed of ball and and playing quite loose. It fits into now how they want to play, where rook speeds have come down. Obviously, if you are straight on ball, you're probably going to get a penalty. But as long as you do an effective job. Do you feel that that is why the likes of the Marcus Smiths, Freddie Stewards, you know, Slades, people who are quite comfortable playing at the line, do you think that's why they're stepping up quite easily? Yeah, I think so. I think it's a, it's a good point. I think they naturally want to play like that, whereas, you know, if you've been playing through this slow period, you naturally want to play back. And, you yeah. know, the habit you create is the ha habit you do. And, and so these young guys are quite prepared to play flair at the line and attack the line more. You, you mentioned about the fact that searching for something else, I mean, without giving away trade secrets, if, if the top eight can all beat each other on the day, what is it that you're searching for that's going to give you the control in those scenarios as opposed to the lottery type 
chances. Well, I think, you know, as you approach a World Cup, and, and, and Michael will be able to add on this, and, and England did it really well, you've got to keep evolving. you just got to have different nuances to your game so it looks the same. We can just do things slightly a bit differently. Like I can remember playing against England, you beat us in June in yeah. Melbourne and absolutely outfaced us. Like I remember the big winger, what was his name? Thank Cohen Cohen. scored a beautiful try yeah. down the right-hand side. And then they got to the World Cup and they played a strong kicking game. So you've got to be able to keep changing your game slightly. So I don't think that was the choice of most of the players no, but, who were in that team. But it happened, didn't it? <laughs> I think yeah. it was taken out of our pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so you've got to continually evolve your game. So it might be just nuances around your set piece, nuances about how you kick. Um, but, you know, we were talking before, I think first phase attack now, particularly with the number of lineouts we're having, is going to become an increasingly important part. Like if you can get one first phase try and one more try, you'll win most tests. It's funny, isn't it? It's like from phase, from first phase to strike, you know where everyone is on the field. So that is what you can look at and actually analyse and try and figure something out. Now, sometimes it might change, but then if you've got the... It's making sure you look at having multiple choices that you can say, okay, that didn't work this time, so he's diving in, we'll, yeah. we'll do that. Yeah. And especially around the back of lineouts yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. you can really work some magic. Are you, I'm not reliant necessarily, are you getting more and more from your in-game analysis now than perhaps you have? Uh, no. No? That hasn't changed anything. Nothing's changed much from there, mate. So how are you picking your opportunities? Is that, are, you, are you spotting things and relaying it? Are the players spotting it and... Are you a coach? Running? Are you a, some coaches that you work to when a, when you end up running water boy and they say we need to kick more? Brilliant. We're three minutes thirty into a game. Or <laughs> 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 are you one that picks specific? Because some coaches yeah. can be like that. They're like, tell them not to drop it. Pretty sure he knows not to drop it. <laughs> do you ever do that, or, uh, or are you more specific about how you're trying to get better, <laughs> mate? That? We've all been through it. We've all been through it, and we're trying to get better. Do you, do you do a bit on communication messaging? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest part of coaching that's changed. Like we, we try to cut out all those junk stuff, yeah. um, but we still do it because emotion gets to you. Um, and that, as I was just saying to you off air, you know, we, with the coaches now, we're using a forensic psychologist to help us improve our communication to the players. Do, do you have, have you got any idea as to what that is actually going to entail? Uh, just, just being able to have more meaningful conversations with the players. Interesting. Because the players these days, you've got to remember the young guys have less conversations because they spend more time on their phone. So the ability to have the right conversation with them is, is so important. Cut through the ball yeah. and get to the or point. Just, or just message them. Yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen? Send, send next, them a meme. The next World Cup, there could be iPhones on the field. <laughs> <laughs> that's God that's good for the sponsor of it. <laughs> God help us all if that's the case. Um, looking ahead to Six Nations, 2022, excited, curious, lots to do. Where are you at with what's to come? Because there are strong runners and riders. Yeah, we, we just want to keep getting better, mate. Just keep playing better. Yeah, we, we're not going you know, to focus too much on we've got to do this or that. We've got a young team and we want them to keep getting better. And each game keep getting a little bit better. What, it what, starts with Scotland and Murray so Phil. Do you, do you see this as... The harder year to win because you've got three away games. It always shifts on how they're. But now France are back. You've obviously got to go to Scotland, who can on their day cause all sorts of problems. You've obviously got to go to France, but you've got Ireland at Wales at home. Would you say this is a tougher year to go and win it, or is it all tough? I think it's all tough, and I think yeah, the big thing I've seen in the six years I've been here is is the the level rising. Yeah, I think if you look at if you look at Six Nations compared to Rugby Championship now, it's, it's pretty favourable, isn't it? Yeah. Like the level of competition's strong. What do you make of France? Uh, good team. They've got Dupont, who's, who's handy. Uh, you know, if we were playing touch football out there, he'd probably get a run somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, yeah. they're a good team. Yeah, they've got a lot of depth. They've got a lot of good young players. But, you know, like any team, they've got their faults. Ireland? Uh, yeah, no, they've brought some good young players through. Um, again, you know, that centralised system gives you the benefit of bringing young players through in a methodical way. Um, they've opened up their game a little bit, um, so they'll be, they'll be tough to beat. I was having a conversation with someone, 
But I also think that the centralized system also can, you can get stuck in getting high end caps playing for a long time without actually bringing up the person behind. So if you look yeah. for them, Murray and Sexton, yeah. when you become very reliant on that, it can then create a void behind yeah. for the next group. So it's a, it's a delicate balance, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. it? No, that's a good point. And they've got a few of those big decisions to make, haven't they? Yeah, they do. Scotland, you've got a bit of history uh, with Scotland personally, last yeah. year obviously as well. <laughs> Is that ringed uh, in red? In no, the well, it's a good challenge, isn't it? Like, you know, they've got Finn Russell who, who's special. He's a special player. You know, if he gets front football, he can do it. Like, he threw this past the Beal. I don't know whether you saw it yeah, on, yeah, on yeah, Friday did. night. Like, that was... The Beal's right, uh, movement yeah. off the ball as well. He's fit, mate. Yeah. yeah. I, t I tell you, people always question Curly Beal every now and again. If you just watch his footwork and his ability to ride passes, change angle onto a pass, he's special. Yeah. Still. He, still. He, was, he was brilliant in that game. Absolutely brilliant. His kick return work, his work off the ball, and that understanding with Russell. Yeah. Um, and then Hogg's obviously in, in probably the best form of his career. So, that, you know, that's going to be a tough game. What about Wales at the moment? Uh, well, they're sort of, you know, Champions, P Pivac Champions. came in and wanted them to play, you know, expansive game and the, the game's been narrowed again. You know, they're playing quite a tight game. But they're, again, they're going to go through a bit of a personnel change. You know, Alan Wynne Jones, whether he plays, a few of their forwards are getting to the to the more tender ages. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they've got. And what can Kieran Crowley do with Italy? Well, he's a bloody good coach, mate. Really good coach, and he's had experience of bringing a tier two country up. Uh, he did really good work with Canada. Yeah, uh, got them up to maybe twelfth in the world, fifteenth in the world, somewhere around that. Um, so he knows how to coach those players. He, you know, he knows how to get the best out of them. Did a great job at Benetton, same thing. Um, so they'll improve under Kieran. I think Italy have got some actual good individual yeah. players now. They've just, they're, they're what you'd say, their nuts and bolts aren't quite tight enough yet. But, you know, with the, the likes of the bat line they've got and then some of the forwards they could do with Jake Paledri getting back. But uh, they've got some players. It's just whether they can, I don't know just whether they can pull that tighter together to actually give them a chance of not leaking tries. I think they're, they're definitely going to be more dangerous. Yeah. Are you happy with your lot at the moment, though? Or are you somebody who's never happy with his lot? Uh, well, we're always looking for who's the next next best player coming through. You know, I've been watching the, the games closely, but uh, I think we're in a, a positive position. Do you Did you get that sense of, because I know you've, you've spoken in the past about a, a team that, England rugby fans can be proud. Did you get a greater sense of that from November than perhaps well, campaigns think, past? Yeah, and and Tins was saying before. I think the the COVID period it was it was a tough period, you know, and and we got criticised a lot for the way we played in order, and, and, yeah, and, and we probably didn't play very good rugby, but we we won, um, and then we played poorly in the Six Nations, and then. Like everything lifted for a while, didn't it? And you had these fans back, 82,000, you know, coincided with some good young players coming through. And the atmosphere, yeah, you know, at the end of that South African yeah. game was fantastic. Good. It was incredible. I, I was sat, I was behind the post and I was like, this is, this is powerful. Yeah. It, it, it felt like a sort of a, a new dawn yeah. type thing coming along. Um, so one of the things that we love on the pod, just sort of, I suppose to move on to something a bit different, is to give people a little bit more time to explain and, and discuss things than, um, than perhaps sound bites or, or tweets might allow. So if I, if I, are you happy for me? I'm going to throw a few names and things at yeah. you with a bit more time uh, to expand on. If I said you Emma Raducanu, what do you say? Uh, well, the point I was trying to make was how difficult it is for young players. Um, and I think the media here makes it extremely difficult for them. They blow them out of proportion. And then because of that, they get enormous amount of commercial opportunities. And the whole point was to say, we've got Marcus Smith who potentially could be a, a really good player. We've got to look after him. That was the only point. Yeah. Did, did, it's one of those that hit, hit the side of the bat, edged it a little bit? Uh, probably. Well, I didn't read any of it, but I'm sure it did. <laughs> Do you get frustrated when points that you're trying to make are taken out of context and it, it becomes something totally... Well, it's, it's the game we're in, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I say something and 
if you want to, if someone wants to take it in a different way, they can do that. So, you know, the easiest thing is to not say anything. Okay. Um, and then you get accused of being <laughs> sullen and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and, you know, you moody. And then if you try to say something, be a bit expressive, you've got, you take that risk. Yeah. Do you quite enjoy the risk? Uh, you, play quite, you play quite a lot, to be fair. <laughs> You've got to play some shots. But yeah. Do you see it genuinely as part of your role and remit to sell the game, to generate? hundred uh, yeah. yeah. percent, yeah. Yeah, rugby, I don't think rugby's grown as much as, as we would have liked. Um, yeah, you came through the early professional era and I don't think we've sold rugby enough. Like, it's a fantastic game and, and we need to make it a better game. Like, can we get better domestic competitions around the world? Can we get better international calendar? Can we make the game better? And I think we should all be, always be driving towards that. Do you think you should be looking at different formats? Obviously, there's World 10s is talked about, the, obviously 12s. the 12s. And is that, obviously it's had success with cricket, but does that necessarily mean it'll have success for rugby? Will it bring through a, a different generation with that space? Or will... Will 15s always be the go-to? I think I think we'll be like cricket, mate. Where Test cricket and Test rugby will always be the paramount, yeah. You know, and that's that's the battle. And then we need an entertainment form of rugby, you know, where young kids can see players do different things. You know, imagine if you had a tens or a twelves where you got the best players in the world playing each other, and they're able to develop their skill sets. You know, they're able to develop different sort of pass, a different sort of kick, like they've done in 2020 cricket. Yeah. Like you see now, there was a, like a, I think it was a, it might have been English batsman, number 11 comes in, the reverse sweeps. <laughs> like, you know, imagine if you did that 20 years ago, he would have got his head cut off. <laughs> and now you're seeing that that sort of skill set that they develop in the 20s go to test cricket. Yeah. And I think we, we ultimately in rugby, we need to create that. So if I give you a pound, and you can invest it in sevens, tens, or twelves. Which one would you put it into? Probably two times six, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, John Mitchell. Lots of headlines around that as well recently. Is, yeah, that, is, look, it, is that storming a storming a teacup? He did four years, mate. Did a great time for us. Decided to move on. Um, I haven't read any of it, so I really don't know. I think he was saying that there wasn't a problem, yeah. but everyone's sort of trying to see if there is one. Like four years is a long time. Yeah. Uh, and did a good job. Don't you? Marrow. I love Marrow in the acting lessons. Are we going to see him at, at, at the Don Bar or in, in the Globe anytime soon? What was the feedback on his acting, Bond, first of all? Bond villain. Yeah. Well, he, he wasn't the only one. There's been a few others right. that have had it. And that's an important part of being able to present and talk and, and carry yourself. Um, but really happy the way he's starting to develop as a yeah. leader within the team. I mean, because you have said in the past, not necessarily England captain, but I think I've read recently you have said, yeah, no, he's now got what he's got. Really, Where really, has he come on in the last six months? Uh, well, I think it's just maturation. Yeah. You know, players mature. They become more sure about themselves. They work out how they talk to the other players. And it comes with time. He's always been very vocal on pitch. Yeah. But he's quite, you know, he's quite, quite a quiet yeah. guy, so it yeah. sometimes takes time to get comfortable in, in that role off it. Yeah. The other thing I read recently, it was about you and the media, and saying that the media love to hate England. Is that game playing or do you genuinely feel that at times? Uh, well, I think, you know, you, you look at the big sports in England, football, cricket, rugby, you know, the teams are either great or they're terrible. There's, there's very little in between. Balance. Yeah. And, you know, again, that sells newspapers. Do you, do you well, I'll ask you about your, sort of your role with it. I mean, do, do you ever mind the flack that you get? Genu genuinely not. It's because no. that's quite a skill in itself is to be able to park everything that's coming to one, to one side and just saying it isn't a thing for. Me. No. But is it is it a part of the the game that you play that you know that you basically know what they're going to say from what you've said, so you accept yeah. that's where no. I wanted them to go. So they've and, gone where and, I wanted them and, to. And, and Are so, you leading them? Yeah, it's a race for a headline, isn't it? They want a certain headline, and I want the players to read something else. Yeah, because every time the players hear or read something. It, it, it makes that message more concrete. Who's winning that battle more often? Uh, no, it's always 50-50, <laughs> Who's in the 15th round that's yeah. slugging it out? Because I remember, funny enough, talking about that, the, um, the Australia tour in 2016, and you mapped out exactly what was going to happen with the Australian media. They're going to cause this, they're going to do that. I, I just, do you, do you spend a bit of time thinking about how you're going to uh, I'm it? lucky, mate. I've got a bloke in Australia uh, who worked with me since the Brumbies, so okay. 2000. 
And every start of each week, he'll have some ideas. Like the idea when we played New Zealand in the semifinals to, that we were going to chase them down the street. You know, that was the whole thing. So we carved up some, he, he creates some lines to say. And so we'll use that. Don't do it all the time, but yeah. when we think it's important. How important a part of the game is it? As in psycho- do you think that there is a psychological Massive. game of being played? Because there's a whole story yeah. and people believe stories. So if you can get the right story out there, you've got a chance of getting the players in the right spot. Because I think that whole idea of, of a player's mindset and what they're thinking is the most important job a coach does. And do you see the impact of the game you play with the media on your players? Sometimes. Sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a not so good way. Okay. And, and you roll the dice a bit, mate. What, hap- what happens though if you then see one who's been, you can see that it's maybe adversely affected them. Are you straight on that in a one-to-one basis? Uh, if, I, if I see it in a player or sometimes I have to apologise to the team, I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you enjoy jousting with the most in the media? Um, or have you? You can go retrospective as well. I like Chris Foy because he's, yeah, he's Daily Mail, you know, and they're always trying to write rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Sign up right here. And in terms of other, coach, uh, other coaches as well, do you have... Oh, I used to enjoy Steve Hansen. Do you? Yeah, because we, we went from right back from the 2000s with Super Rugby and we always sort of... There's a nice, you know... You never, you never got arrested by Hansen and Pivak, the <laughs> Super Super Cops <laughs> and you, in their Ford Mustang and their flared jeans. <laughs> Do you know, funny if it's funny you say that, because I can remember off the back of that semi-final, I remember you having quite a long chat with Steve Hansen, pitch side. And was, is there a sort of, it's a bit like after a boxing match, you, there's a sort of an embrace off the back yeah. of it. Is there, is there quite a lot of respect that goes alongside yeah. the enjoyment yeah. of the battle? Yeah, 100%. And Clive was good, mate. I enjoyed Clive in that period because yeah, they had a better team than we had and we were trying to find some way to upset them. I'd, I'd, love, <laughs> I'd love to see the, the notes and the team meetings yeah. in which you did that. How did you go for Clive? Um, no, it was always about rugby issues, um, you know, the mall or something about the scrum, just trying to find a way to get some agitation there. Was, was, but that would have been early days of where ref meetings became yeah, a weekly yeah, thing yeah. And, and trying to get into the ref yeah. beforehand. It was, a big, I remember, it was always a big role in the week, that, that ref meeting. <laughs> it was always the way it started. And is that the same now? Uh, not so much because the refs, refs are much better prepared now. Yeah. Like they'll come in with their own game plan of how they want the game to be. Um, and because of technology too, you know, we're killing the referees at the moment with technology. We're mm. ki- absolutely killing them. And what's and, the fix? Well, I think it's got to go back. We've got to wind it back and not expect the game to be perfect. Yeah. Like go back to saying, right, uh, we'll do uh, try line decisions. So active and, scoring stuff. And the only other thing is, if a referee meet, misses an obvious red card, go back. Yeah. So he, he sees you, Mike hits you high, right, with a swinging arm. Yeah, quite And likely. you've missed it. He so there's a red card there, go back and check yeah. it. But if it's not an obvious... That's where the TMO shouldn't... It shouldn't be a deliberation. Yeah. You need to take away that yeah. deliberate, let me show you. It needs to yeah. either be a definite yellow card or a definite red yeah. card or just crack yeah. on. Do, do you think we'll get to that? Oh, sorry, uh, you I think we'll have to, mate, because if you go to a game now, there's 30 minutes ball in play and 70 minutes ball out of play. Yeah. Now, it's all right if you're a drinker in it because <laughs> there's plenty of chances to get points. But if you're not a drinker, you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs waiting for the game to start. Yeah. Like I think if, if it's not an obvious red card and it's not an obvious yellow card, then put the player on report. Don't check yeah. it. And then it gets – they can yeah. watch it for 17 hours – during the week and, and decide whether it's a it's it's needs more. Get you, on with we've got to get think, on with the game. Do you think too many? I know this is obviously play welfare being at the most, but do you think too many games have been decided now by cards? I think we're getting to a this a, a, a situation where it is, mate. So and w- would you like to see something like people branded around this orange card where the player who creates the foul by what could be a rugby incident but makes contact with someone's head, he gets removed from play but someone can come on. Yeah, and, and then he goes place. on report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the That's actual worth, team doesn't get punished worth for consideration. Yeah. rugby. I think, I think it needs to go somewhere like that. Can I ask you about the Lions this summer? Did you watch it? Uh, yes. How yes. did you find that? Uh, well, it was on the back of all the COVID stuff, you know, I thought, 
the two teams had a tough campaign. You imagine you go on the Lions tour and you know, you're looking forward to it. It's a good rugby, good social event and all that gets taken away. So I think it was pretty tough on them. And they obviously went in there saying we were going to beat them up and yeah. it didn't work. Yeah. You've obviously sparred with Warren Gatland a bit in the past. Do you, do you communicate with other coaches at other points like that? Do you send a message? No. Let him get on with it. Um, Rassi has obviously had some headlines as well. Did, did you watch the full 40? Yeah, yeah. You watched the whole thing? Yeah. Marks out of 10? Uh, well, for accuracy, yeah. it's probably 9 out of 10. Right. Uh, for respect, probably 0 out of 10. Right. What, what, did, what, what did you make of it in the aftermath of it? And the, 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 the delay in the decision, the decision that's been made? I know it's a, a tricky... Well, subject, but we've seen Rassi do it. We've seen Dave Rennie explode. Um, we've got a problem with the referee, yeah. You know, and every coach feels like that at some stage. Like we had that game against Wales in the Six Nations, where there was two tries that weren't tries. Um, but we can't afford to act like that because then it's just going to make it worse. What I think we need to do is simplify how we use technology, give the referee respect and be really hard on coaches who criticise the referee. How often have you felt like doing a Rassi or a Dave Rennie? Oh, plenty of times. Right. <laughs> How do you stop yourself? Uh, well, at the end of the day, like I got into trouble when I was young, mate. Uh, 2007, I think. I sprayed this referee after a Reds game um, and I got fined $10,000. And I had to pay it myself. Did you really? Yeah. And I had to pay 5,000 legal fees. So it was expensive. Wow. Um, and I, and it wasn't times. good for the game. Like at the end of the day, it's not good for the game. And you set a bad precedent for your team, you know, because you're saying you can carry on like that. And then, then if he gives away a penalty and says something to the referee, it's very hard to then coach him in that area. So I decided after that I wasn't going to say anything. And I've stuck to that probably 99% of the time. Is there well, 99% a ninety-nine percent of the time you can't change it? Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah one hundred percent. But is there a is there a better way of doing things which would enable uh, enable it to, to become easier in that dialogue? Yeah, well, I think one of one of the things is to have better relationships. Like we used to have a lot of get-togethers, coaches and referees, and I think those sort of social events help because it just gets a better understanding of each other. And, and, yeah, most of the, it's like most business conferences. Most of the business is done at the bar afterwards. And it's the same with those coaching conferences. Like regularly you used to have referees and coaches get together at the start of tournaments. Now, obviously, COVID's put a hold on that. But I think we need to get that, that, those better relationships. And even with the senior players. Yeah. Because it's a bloody tough game to referee. Well, I was going to say, do you have sympathy for the man in the middle? 100%. And I reckon they've got a referee in threes. As well, like really referees in threes. So if we've got a we've got a ruck there, that that referee there has to be in charge of that 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 ruck looking for things. The far ref, far assistant referee must be looking at the offside line because he's in the best way to look at it. He's got time to look at it. Yeah. And so if they really divvied that up and worked as three together, I reckon we could get much better referee. But it's not part of the game, the fact that there are so many nuances. There are so many decisions that can be made at so many different points, at so many points. Yeah, right but, we, but we just want to get the obvious ones. Right. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's the great thing about our game is the contest. And, and so we've got so many contests going on that you can win or lose a game through a number of contests. But if we try to get every, we referee every contest perfectly, yeah. we end up with what we've got at the moment, 30 yeah. penalties a game, 30 minutes ball in play, 70 minutes ball out of play. Got you. Um, as Hask would say, you've done a book, Out in Time for Christmas, <laughs> available in all good bookshops and retailers <laughs> and hopefully in most rugby fan stockings. Why, why a book at this point? Uh, well, the, the publishers came and saw me during the lockdown uh, following the last one. And I'd always wanted to do one on leadership because when I was a young coach coming through, I read a book from Pat Riley and from Bill Walsh. It was Pat Riley, yeah. the uh, yes. LA Lakers, wasn't it? Yeah. Lakers. And then Bill Walsh was the 49ers. And they were like encyclopedias and it helped me a lot as a young coach coming through. I thought if I can share a few things that I've learned along the way, there might be a young coach that learned something. Did you write it yourself on the typewriter? Um, or have you done a little <laughs> phone call or two? No, phone call, sorry. Okay. Are you pleased with it? Are you, are you pleased with it? Uh, look, I don't think you can ever say you're pleased, but if someone gets something out of it, it'll be good. Yeah. It's definitely going to be some, a tagline for Eddie, isn't it? Never really pleased. Yes. Always... <laughs> dot, 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 dot. <laughs> um, what, what sort of inspiration have you taken and put into that book? Give us, give us a bit of a sort of a snapshot of it. Uh, just 
just the fact that I think, you know, if you keep learning and keep uh, having a, a sense of humility, then you can keep getting better. Like, yeah, you know, I don't think I'm anywhere near as good a coach as I can be. I can still keep improving. Got you. Learn from every mistake. Yeah, right? yeah. And how, do you use books like this to send messages to, to players, to people? Uh, not, not to really? players. No, yeah. this is more to the young coaches. Got you. Like, you know, a young coach in Japan sent me an email last night saying he's read it. I uh, really appreciate it. So, yeah, that makes you feel good. Yeah. Young. There's, some, there's obviously some very interesting bits that come out of it as well, but I'm just interested as to, as to the leadership side of it. You've obviously got a, a big job to do for the next couple of years, but, but beyond that, I know you said a while ago, beach, rum, pina colada and cricket. Is that, is that the dream post-2023 or have you got a lot more things that you'd like to do? Uh, I'm not even going to worry about it now. Don't worry mate. about it now. Just, just knock on with a the next two years. Are you interested? Get through one more winner, <laughs> I'll be <all> right. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Are you interested though in, in, in leadership in a longer term sort of thing? Have you, have, you, have you got an urge to sort of impart what you've learnt over your career? Uh, or is it just a little book? This is a little something for those This is something I've done. It's yeah. done. Um, yeah, if I can help people, I'll help them. But I've got no urge to be a, a spokesman on leadership. I don't think I'm, yeah, I'm just a rugby coach, mate. I right. just coach rugby. I've been lucky enough to coach against good players and with good players. And I just want to see how much I can do that for. Um, one of the things I've enjoyed recently is your interview with Brian Moore. Did you play against Brian back yeah, in? You yeah. did. I would have done a few times. <laughs> is it quite, do, you, do you find it curious meeting up, whatever it is, 20, 30 years yeah, later? Yeah, 100%. Is it? Yeah. Because you can remember what was being said at the bottom of a ruck back in those days. <laughs> no, do you enjoy not, not sparring? With, it, was, it was cover up. Yeah. Bottom of I remember the scrums back then. Like We used to literally run into each other. Yeah. Christ. <laughs> but do you enjoy sparring, with, sparring in, the, in a media sense in the way that you used to in the... Um, in, the, in your boots? Yeah, well, he's a pretty bright Blake, isn't yeah. he, Brian? And uh, he's always got a point of view that he wants to get across, so it's always good to have a chat too. Um, the other one I enjoyed was your sit down with Michael Checker in, <laughs> uh, in November. I mean, if you would, I'd love to know how you sort of almost square that away, knowing him as you do, playing with him as you did at Randwick, competing against him as you did as, in, in the coaching capacity. Is it curious having a frothy coffee and a, a chin wag in that environment? Yeah, no, really good. Yeah. You know, I'm glad that he's recovered. He had a tough time coaching Australia at the end. Did really well initially. Then at the end, it was a tough, tough uh, job for him. And he's come out of the world, looks healthy, uh, getting on with it, doing a bit with Argentina. Um, you know, I think he might end up in France somewhere at some stage, coaching somewhere, and just looks well. So it was good to have a, a chat to him, a bit of a laugh. Do you ever think you will cross the Rubicon to, into the media? That's the one thing I'm not going to do, mate. <laughs> Is that a red grave? Yeah. You, you see 100%. 100%. Yeah. I don't want to be one of those. Clipped up. I don't Would you never, be, we've got no interest in No, in I don't want to be one of those coaches that, that knows everything. Why like, not? I don't know enough <laughs> now. So I, I don't want to be one that sits there on the microphone and tells everyone what they should be doing. Do you not think a little newspaper column and some, it's, there's no, good coffee in studio. I've done cozy. Daily Mail. Yeah. You've done Daily done. Mail with Chris Foy. <laughs> 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 Takes on to no one. I, that's interesting, though. That there's no sort of urge to that at all. No, move on. Um, what's on the to-do list now? What, what, what's left to do in 2021? I want to find three good young players. Positions? Any positions. Any positions. This is genuinely, do, yeah. do, are you always looking to, to yeah. bolster those ranks? Well, I reckon that if you can keep changing your squad 20%, you keep that freshness, you keep younger players coming through, you make it obvious that the team's got to keep improving. Do you think that's the thing that, because going back to what we were talking about, that you get you can sometimes get stuck into experience, can't yeah. you? Into, yeah, yeah. Do you think it, you, there's, you're going to see a higher turnover rate rather than getting these guys up to 90, 100 caps? It's going to, be, it's going yeah. to now be a quicker rotation. Yeah, yeah I think you that might, might have a 20, 30 yeah. match span and then yeah. someone else will step up to the plate. I've got this bit of untested theory at the moment. I reckon the game is becoming more suited to younger players because there's less sort of experience points in the game. Is that... I'm not yeah. probably making no, but sense. I, 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 and I, I, I see the same. game getting younger for a period, of, just like football has. Like yeah. football has become a running game. And it's funny, I reckon rugby's starting to move towards that. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think we're, we're, we're moving towards that. I always feel because they don't worry about consequence, there's not as much worry about consequences. They just like, well, if they score, we'll score two more. Yeah. Whereas, whereas yeah. it was sort of drilled into our age, it was all about protecting your edges. Yeah. You don't concede tries. The old World Cup stat of the 
the team that concedes the least amount of points always wins the World Cup. So it's, it was, uh, I think it definitely has changed a little bit, plus with a few ring fencing issues, so people are brought up in an environment where they don't yeah. have to worry about what's coming tomorrow. Do, do you see that fearlessness of youth in the charges you've got, and how has that impacted you as a coach? Well, it hasn't impacted me as a coach. But you probably made to coach me more, players more differently. hunger to look for, for good young players yeah. coming through. Um, do you have a checklist on what, like, what a good young player is it? Does it have to have tick something in the mental box, physical box, and then the skill set uh, box? Or? One of the things I was taught, mate, um, Bob Dwyer, uh, he always said, look for the players with the things you can't coach. So that's my number one thing. You know, what can't I coach? If that player's got it, then he then he immediately captures the attention. Maybe he can help me learn to yeah, coach. Yeah. <laughs> Because when you look at Marcus Smith, and I suppose when you look at Quinns winning the Premiership as well, that is the, the style of rugby they played. Would you, would you ever see that working in the, in the international arena? Do you see more of that coming into the international game or are they very different? Well, there'll be, there'll be games like that, yeah. um, but that's not normal. Right. Like rugby's a contest game. And so you'll get like, you look at the 2000s when Australia and New Zealand played tests like that, where the ball was fizzing around 39, 38. So there'll be tests like that. But that's the normal game is, is it's a hard physical contest that breaks. Yeah. And that's the other thing I reckon, like if you look at rugby now, 70% of rugby is played in, in one pass, 70%. So that's in the 20 metre. So from here to here, 70% of the game is played. The other 30% is played out there. And so your ability, and that, I reckon that will change a little bit over the next period of time. They'll go maybe 60-40. So then your ability to be able to use that space and, and, and score in that, in that space is going to be enormously important. And that's where these young players are coming through because they've got the skills to do it. Interesting. What are you most looking forward to about next year? Uh, Scotland game. <laughs> <laughs> Said with a smile and a chuckle. Um, Eddie, it's been very nice to catch yeah. up. Thank you very no, much indeed for your time. Your book is out now. Yeah. We'll hopefully get a signed copy from you and stick it on our bookshelf. Good luck for all that's to come and have a Thanks, happy, boys. very short Christmas. Same to you. Lovely to catch up. Thank you, thank you. Well, there he goes. A happy England coach. Probably happier now than he was post Six Nations, but it's been, how would you mark 2021 out of 10 for England? Um, well, obviously you give that Six Nations quite a low mark. Yeah. But then I think we've talked about and what we mentioned there about these young players coming through and, and you know, interesting what you were saying about so you could be getting a younger player again. But a lot of it makes sense. Um, I, uh, but I'd given them, I'd given them a good eight out in that November. A lot to look forward I mean, to. Tonga is obviously a difficult one, but then the the, the Australia, Australia game was sort of a seven. They should have won by more in yeah. that game. But then you know, South Africa gets a high score just for the fact of how good they were in the first half. But then how they had to come back and win, and yeah. you know all the questions that you want to be asked of those young players, and they all answered them. So I think he's in a pretty good place. Lots to look forward to, obviously, moving forwards as well. Um, there are much better podcasts out there than ours, debriefing on all things integrated rugby, but just give us a snapshot on round one of Europe. Did you watch um, much of it? I, Any of it? I didn't get it? to see loads of it. I've watched the highlight packages, but um, obviously... Uh, Leic I think Leicester, probably the, Le the headline. Leicester were fantastic. Um, Rassing yeah. on Friday night were sensational. Yeah. Now, you could say that Northampton weren't very good, but... Still, the wrestling were good. Um, we said on the show we did with Shane Horgan that it could, it should. There are enough individuals out there yeah. to sort of to really throw this tournament open. And I think it was a good, good start to the good campaign. I think it's going to get going at that round sixteen bit. I know we didn't do a very good job of explaining yeah. it last time, but I think the pools. You've got one or two teams in there who. Yeah. Are possibly making up the numbers yeah. come the knockouts I think that's when it's going to get really exciting but anyway enjoy all the rugby that's to come obviously round two this weekend uh, BT Sport and Channel 4 just before we go a little bit of Spiz section for you um, and just to mark your cards actually it's some sad news which is that the Ospreys player Ethan Phillips has been involved very sadly in a serious motorbike accident a, a week or so ago and it's left him with life-changing injuries I'm sure a number of you will have seen this across social media there is a funding page that has been set up for those who'd like to donate any amount to help the cause so that Ethan can receive the absolute best medical care uh, as he seeks to make his transition back to as normal a life as possible as quickly as possible. The money that they are raising will take care of the needs of Ethan and his family 
after a devastating event. And if you'd like to get involved in that in any way, shape or form, please, don't, uh, please go have a look at his GoFunding page. Elsewhere, uh, Coach Kayser has been on the phone and on January the 15th, uh, one of our wheels on the good, the bad and the rugby, Ben, is coaching Oxford University against England under 20s. It's taking place at Ifley Road. Tickets are on sale now. If you want to go and watch uh, the under 20s getting ready for, uh, ready for the Six Nations, uh, you can head to ourfc.org uh, and you get a ticket from a fiver. So well worth doing that. Uh, and a quick reminder as well that if you're looking for any Christmas gifts at this time of year, perhaps we'll send some to Eddie, given how... <laughs> Uh, low key, his Christmas is going to be. <laughs> we don't uh, need to send much, but we don't need to send much. No, exactly, a pencil sharpener or, or two. Uh, <laughs> you can come along to our tour in the spring. We are heading across the UK and Ireland: Sheffield, Liverpool, Edinburgh, Cardiff, Newcastle, Manchester, Dublin, Nottingham, Plymouth, Swansea, Oxford, London, Birmingham, Bath, and Southend. If any of those are anywhere near you, and you fancy coming along for what should be a really enjoyable evening, uh, tickets are on sale now, and the info is on our website. Nice to get into things here at Penny Hill. What do you yeah. make of this just well, before we go? I was going to say, if, if we'd have had this back in 03, I think we'd, have, we'd have worked, it'd worked comfortably. Yeah. We'd have won comfortably. No, it's unbelievable. Um, it's just it's what it should be, really. Elite. Uh, elite is definitely good. what you'd say it is. On your Penny Hill. Thank you very much indeed to Eddie Jones for joining us as well. We have been the good, the bad and the rugby. Uh, as I'm sure you know, we'll see you next week. We've got a Christmas party coming your way. Uh, this show is pulled together by producers Shara Kilgallen and Connor Hewitt. And the world-class fixer that is Matt Chuck Norris, the good, the bad and the rugby, is a folding pocket production. Have a very good rest of your week. See you next time.